Okay, here we go. And I have a bragging moment because before lunch I did the calculation of you talk, I talk. I got it down to 39 me, 61 you. <laughs> I usually can't get quite that good. <laughs> so <clears throat> now we're going to talk about self-monitoring and that was the one of the executive functionings that I told you that through that Causes and Cures book, you will see that in every chapter because where the kids don't focus on monitoring how well am I focusing, they tend not to get better. If they are not monitoring how much more organized am I now than I was back before I tried this stuff, then it doesn't get any better. So <clears throat> this is John Hattie's research or an, uh, a visual about it. He has done 150 strategies over a quarter of a billion kids all over the world. So you think his error might be kind of on the small side? I mean, this is some serious research. And so he has taken those 150 strategies, and you don't have this because I just decided to put it in okay. before lunch. <laughs> and <clears throat> he has laid them out of these things which are like a 0.04 and below. I think that one says 0.05 really do not help much. In fact, they could almost do a little prevention of full um, uh, impact of teaching. These yellow strategies are things that when you do them, they make a little bit of difference, but not a huge amount of difference. And the green are the things that he calls factors resulting in Stunning success. Blue? That's just an arrow. Oh, I don't know. Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is. <laughs> yes, <yeah>, she's good. <laughs> so um, this is all coming from a book called Visual Learning. Now there are two versions of visual learning. One is visual learning, one's visual learning for teachers. It's a little tough slogging if you don't get the visual learning for teachers. I mean, the man is a researcher. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of practical stuff in there, but this is just amazing. So things like student mobility would be a factor that messes with kids' achievement, and you know that already. And so what can you do to mitigate that? I'm one of the school systems in Ohio has a bunch of school where almost every year 70% of their kids turn over. Now can you imagine only a third of your kids being the original third? But they tend to move in the city and so they might come back multiple times but every time you do that there's this big gap in their learning. Look at that one. The more we label students, the more we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot. And yet teachers are saying, we need to test that kid, label him, and dispatch him. And you go, that is not a healthy thing. It's not the labeling that causes the problem. It's what happens mentally with the people that surround the child and the child, him or herself. So a lot of times, and this happens so subtly that you don't catch it. I can remember, because originally when I was a special ed teacher, it was a pull-out model. And the kids stayed with me most of the time, almost all the time, to tell you the truth. And what became the norm for me started to shift downward. And I'm going, she can write three paragraphs, and I'm just, woo-hoo. And they go, yeah, but other kids her, name, her age can write seven. And you go, ooh, yeah. Right. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't celebrate the things that are going well. It's just you need calibration of what is typical for that age child. With one of the high school teachers, <clears throat> I kept saying to her, we need to put these seniors in with the other seniors. And she said, are you kidding me? These kids have IQs of way down here. But she held her nose and went with it. <clears throat> and when I came in one day, she said, 
I am just emotional to a point of tears. She said, we did put those ki my kids in with her kids. And it's, it's still my hers as opposed to ours. And the kids were giving oral reports. She said, I never, never would have asked my kids to do that assignment. But because they were in that classroom, we treated them all as equals. And yes, I had to support my kids. And yes, the reports they gave weren't of the same caliber as a lot of the kids in there. But every one of my kids got up and gave a report. And she said they were so excited and so proud of themselves. And she said, if anybody would have asked me if that was even possible, I would have said, really, are you kidding me? So I think sometimes we lose our sense of what kids are truly capable of and our ceiling becomes their ceiling. And my nephew who got an IEP on Tuesday, when my sister asked him to read something to her on Friday, he said, oh, I can't, you know I'm LD. So right, boom, right there you have the problem with that. Retention. 50% of the children who are retained will not graduate. You sure you want to do that as the intervention? 99.6% of the kids who are retained twice will not graduate. Why would you ever choose to do that? So the problem with retention is not that you're giving them what my kindergarten teacher used to call the gift of time. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. So it's that the next year you're going to do the same stuff with them. And sometimes it's the same teacher who's doing the same stuff with them. Guess what? If it didn't work first time around, doing it louder and longer the second time is typically not a good choice. Now, if they're with a different person and they have lots of different strategies, you could make a big difference there. But that is not typically what is done with a retention. It's just doing the same thing again. Is there a reason why they are not getting it in the first place? And if you're not drilling down and going for ground level stuff, there's a good chance that's not a good choice. I mean, it's always about who the teacher is and how you set up the program. I have seen those, you know, those stepping stone, you know, you just call it a different name. What it really is is just picking up where you left off, hopefully and moving forward, where some, if it's a really fabulous teacher, sometimes they actually surpass the kids who are in the regular first, and they end up going to second with all the other kids, and they're good to go. And who knows how much of that is maturity level, you know, just readiness for doing certain things, and how much of it is the, you know, brilliance of that teacher. I have also seen those in-between steps that were a total failure. Uh, I mean, I have one in mind, <laughs> and you go, that teacher needs to be fired. Sorry, but it, it, it was. I mean, she was just doing nothing but kindergarten stuff again. And you go, that is not the point of that, that transition year. Would those children have been better off with a first grade teacher who knew how to differentiate? Yeah. So the other scary thing about putting them in those transition year things is now you have a whole bunch of kids who struggle and that's all you have in there. So all the good models that could really pull them up and move forward are all gone, which is the same problem with siloing kids in special ed of who's the model? Who's to calibrate higher? Tracking students, which is exactly what you just ask of, okay, low kids, medium kids, high kids. How many times have you heard people say, well, I teach the high kids? And you go, what's the deal with that? So I think there's uh, something coming out of the state departments, at least I know in some states, called a social justice movement, where they are checking schools for, do you have a balance of categories in all of your programs? Do you have all boys in AP science and math? Where are your girls? Do you have children of color not making the same strides as children who are Caucasian?
Do you have children in poverty not making the same strides as children who are, fr are affluent? And they're just looking at all the demographics there and saying, is there something about the way you're teaching kids as opposed to where these kids could actually be that is causing something to not work well? And it's not a pretty picture. It is not. And so that's all about tracking, worse in high school and middle school than any place. In this kind of works but not so well is, or makes no difference, kind of, that's the yellow part, makes very little difference. Class size would be one of the issues that he studied. And I think in California for about 10 years they did um, some research where they, you know, the teachers union was really crying about the size of classes. And so they took the class sizes way down and studied the results and guess what they found? No significant difference. Now could it have made significant difference? I think as a teacher, when I have 15 kids as opposed to 30 in my classroom, I can do a better job. But this is what the issue is. It is not the class size. It's what the teacher does while you have these fewer kids that would make the difference. So just saying, okay, I used to have 30, now I have 15, I'm going to do exactly what I did when I had 30. Why were, would you do that? The whole point of reducing the size is so that you can differentiate better and get to everybody and give more feedback. And if you don't do that, class size doesn't make the difference. Homework. Oh, this is the big one. Marzano's research says in elementary schools, homework makes no significant difference on student achievement. In middle school, there's just a tiny touch of difference in school achievement. And the higher they get into high school, the more difference it possibly can make. But it depends on the kind of homework that you are giving, for one thing. Does that mean elementary teachers should never give homework? No, there's more than academic achievement that you're trying to establish there. It's study habits and routine and taking responsibility. But sometimes we go just a little overboard. No, we, a lot of times we go a whole bunch overboard on homework. How much of the grade should homework count? Have that conversation at your table. So the tables I ask are going, hmm, small. <laughs> small is exactly what they're saying. Although I have seen teachers, and you have taught with teachers, no doubt that count homework might be 20, 25% of a student's grade. And if you listen to Gusky or Connors or some of the men who talk about grading, uh, you know, internationally, they're talking about probably something around 2% of the grade being homework. And because a lot of teachers will say, if I don't give it a grade, the kids will just blow it off totally. Well, that says something about how you're handling homework, to tell you the truth. But that could be true. So maybe you're giving points of some kind that would not heavily weigh on the grades. And they say, well, but the kids who are doing it need to be rewarded. Here's my response to that. How do you know who did it? A lot of these kids who are handing in stuff every single day, mom and dad are doing it, or somebody on the bus is doing it. You don't know who did that. If you can't see the kid do the work, then you don't know what they know. So is a grade, Anne was saying, what is a grade? What is it supposed to do? And if you're truly believing the grade should reflect what a child knows, homework isn't it. Homework is practice so that you can check the next day and see if they know it. So you get the idea of what they're saying about homework of, eh, Hardly any difference at all, actually, except when you get in high school. Computer-assisted instruction is also minimal growth for the most part. Could it be higher? It sure could. 
It's when you buy a computerized program and there's no small group teacher instruction that's following up on the parts that the kids are getting wrong and struggling with, and the only thing you can do is go back and do the lesson again, that they're finding out that that is not a particularly powerful way. It doesn't do a lot of harm. It doesn't do a lot of good either. So here's kind of my thinking, and probably most people would agree with that, is why would you waste time you know, doing a lot of this stuff when you can do this kind of stuff and put your energy in the top 10 things? And the very, very top one up there is self-reported grades slash student expectations. Now, he is from... I think he lives in Australia. He's originally from New Zealand, he being John Hattie. So a lot of the terms he's using are not the conventional terms that we would use in the U.S. to do the same thing. So a portion of what he's talking about as that top thing, which is 1.44 effect size. Do you understand how big that is? That could be as much as three years growth in one if it's done extremely well. And a lot of what we've talked about yesterday goes into that of kids, first of all, knowing what good looks like and where they're aiming, how to break that down into pieces so that they can see and vision themselves getting from where they are to where they need to be. One of the things John Hattie did in this, uh, this research is give the kids the exam before they took it and have them predict once they look through the questions what their grade would probably be and the kids are dead on right. So you understand taking the exam isn't really to inform the students about anything, it's to inform the teachers about what they know and don't know. And a lot of times the kids don't even get the exam back or don't look at the exam once they get it back. They look at the grade and go, who, too bad about that. <laughs> So, gone. So, when you teach kids to look at assessments and diagnose what do I have and what do I don't, uh, what don't I have, and what's my plan for getting from here to there, now you're talking about something that has some power behind it. So, <clears throat> this is the self -monitor monitoring big five of how are things going. <coughs> How do kids know how things are going? Do you know how many times I ask teachers, so what does your pre-assessment result look like? And they go, I don't give a pre-assessment. I don't have time for that. They go, really? How are the kids supposed to know what they already know and what they don't? And more importantly, how do you know what the kids already know? You can spend a lot of time on things that kids are already good to go with. And you need that time on some of the things that are more difficult. And then if they can just look at that, but they don't make decisions about it, it doesn't count for anything. Celebrate what you did well. <coughs> Adjust what's not working by making a plan for yourself. How are you going to change the result the next time you take this assessment? And then the self-talk is a critical piece for self-monitoring. So if we look at that, one of the things that is really good to do is have the kids keep their own data. How many of you do that now? You, you have kids chart their own data. So what does that look like, Corey? Uh, so there are lots of different things you can, uh, you can track about anything, actually. I mean, I'm, I could, the common thing to track would be oral reading fluency especially for kids who struggle with reading. How many words per minute do you read? And then as that goes up, especially in the younger grades, there is always a correlation between the increased comprehension and increased fluency. Now, fluency isn't just fast. It's also reading with enough expression that you can tell that they really understand the text and they're saying the right words and they're <laughs> using the punctuation to get the meaning of it. So... <clears throat> When they're above third grade, sometimes the kids can read like the wind, but they get to the bottom of the page and they don't have a clue what they just read. 
So I prefer to use a maze probe. Are you, you know in what I'm talking about? Every seventh word after the first sentence is um, either isol uh, blanked out, so the kids have to write in what should go there, or there are three choices and they just circle the correct probe. If you go to interventioncentral.com, there is a maze probe generator there that all you have to do is type in a passage and if you push a button called next it will say here are the two distractors for each seventh word that we suggest if you like it you push the button next and it creates the passage for the kids so you can do that with any text so <clears throat> when the kids say okay I, I used to be 50 words per minute, and now I'm 60 words per minute. Are you getting better? How? Here's the question, though. How did you get better? And if they can reflect and tell you what it was that made them better, now you're talking about Hattie's research. If they go, I don't know, I'm just smart. <laughs> now, we're, now we're talking a problem. Because they need to understand it's their effort and their strategies that make them better, not just the fact that you're smart or don't feel smart. And that's Carol Dweck's work, and we're going to look at that in a few minutes. So studies show as much as a 26% gain in achievement when kids track their own progress and reflect on it. So that's just cool stuff. So does it always have to be a test? that they're charting. No, you can put together uh, a rubric and say, okay, where were you initially? Where are you now? What makes you think that? Defend your, where you're moving yourself on the rubric. So for instance, when I would say to my son, okay, go clean your room. And he would say, I did. And I'll go, no, you didn't. I was just up there. It is a total wreck. He goes, no, I cleaned it. Now, here was the problem. It wasn't that he hadn't moved stuff around up there. It was his idea of what clean is, and my idea of what clean is were not even in the same zip code. And so until you get that rubric clear in their head, they'll swear they did it, you'll swear they didn't, it, and both of you in your own terms are correct. So I would start out with him by saying, okay, Here's the deal, Kent. When you go up there and I go up there, nothing should be on the floor that I wouldn't put on the floor. Now go up and check. So you know what he did. He threw it all on the bed. <laughs> and so you go, okay, now, next time, <laughs> nothing on the floor or bed. And by the way, the dresser can only have seven things on it because I knew what was going to happen. There was a uh, higher level that all this stuff was going to go. And so... I said, only seven things can be on the dresser. Now, I didn't care if there were seven pair of dirty socks. As far as I was concerned, we were making progress. So our rubric, once he got used to an easy rubric, was going to get a little more detailed and go a little higher. If you give kids too many things on their rubric, they, you just go, I'll just take the punishment, just go for it. So... <clears throat> And then this is, uh, well, let me stop right there and let you have a talk about this. How are you currently, first of all, what are you tracking? Not you tracking. What are you having kids track? How do they track it? Have you ever used a rubric to track it? And how did that work for you? So three minutes. Now, how many of you talked about ways you track academic performance? Like reading, math, those kind of things. Did any of you talk about how you track executive functioning skills? So if you could give a specific example of, let's just talk organization. How can a child chart? Our, because see, what you're trying to do is say, is what we're doing with you moving that needle at all. And a lot of the kids don't have any clue if they're getting better or not. They need some visible, tangible evidence. 
And the awareness of what you are doing correctly and what you are not doing correctly is where it all has to start. So if you were being, you're a shout outer, <laughs> I might say, yesterday you shouted out six times. So I'm going to put six post-it notes on your desk. And why, why six? That's his baseline data from yesterday. And I'd say, now, if you shout out, just hand one of those to me. I'll be real sneaky about it. Just give it to me. And so, because the idea here is not punitive. It's teaching awareness because your point is well taken. If they are not aware of the fact they're doing it, they can't get better at it, trust me. So, he shouts out, and I just walk over and go, and so... And he sees me coming and goes, what did I just do? And we might have to have a conversation about it at a time when nobody's paying attention and say, and I might even write on the post-it note, this is what you said that caused, you know, and he might say, but I was really excited. I knew the answer. And he'd go, and I would be happy to call on you if you would just put up your hand. And sometimes I would say to kids when, you know, he would shout out an answer and I would say, you know, if you put up your hand, I'll call on you and give that answer. And then I would come over here and talk and you'd put up your hand and I'd say, okay, what did you have to say? Even though we all heard it the first time, the point is, this is the procedure. You need to get that one in your head. So the game will be, please try to end up with at least one of those papers by the end of the day. Can you think of some things that adults do, habits adults have, that are extremely difficult to break? Okay, so answering text on your phone and just or texting somebody and and that is called the 20 somethings syndrome <laughs> that's what my doctor calls it <laughs> although i'm i'm finding that it, it spans a bigger range than 20 somethings so that would be one what else harder than that one even hmm? interrupting. interrupting maybe yeah smoking. smoking that's the one that came to my mind weight loss <laughs> not exercising, gossiping. I mean, could we go on? Now, if I tell you, you need to stop gossiping, will you just say, oh, okay, and stop it? Oh, no. How many times have any of you decided to eat healthy or exercise more, and you've fallen off that wagon at least 10 times? Maybe in a very short amount of time. I mean, I can certainly <laughs> say I own that one. Do you understand that if it is a habit with you, just having a teacher say stop it or punish you for not doing what they say is not going to make that better. You're going to need to get into a new pattern of thinking. You're going to need to have conferences. You're going to need to keep check. That's what all these Weight Watchers, uh, all those people are about support system, keeping measurements, tracking your progress, celebrating your successes, and making promises that next week you'll do better. And so that is exactly why teachers think that just because you've punished them five times for it, that ought to make that go away. It's not going to happen. The other thing you have to understand is if a child has a disability, their middle name is, I am inconsistent. So I might be great for two weeks, and then all of a sudden, it's all off. I could be doing great, and then we have Thanksgiving break. They come back, and you go, whoa, this is not pretty. And then they get up to speed again, then you have Christmas break, and you go, whoa. And it's this backslide, move forward, backslide, move forward. If you don't anticipate that, then you say, these interventions don't work with this kid. And you go, yeah, they do. You're just expecting something that's not reasonable. So, <clears throat> what if all of a sudden Rich has a bad day, he's been keeping, you know, a couple of papers each day, but the next day he goes 11 interruptions. Then I give him 11 pieces of paper and we just <coughs> go from there. It's like there is no penalty for being consistently good. 
and then you might end up with seven of them. The more you end up with, and are there prizes for ending up with seven? Probably not, unless they just absolutely, you know, very small children sometimes, or very immature children may need to start with actual physical prizes. But every once in a while, could we say, let's celebrate, let's, let's, I'll treat you to a Coke. Yes, but you see, it's not something that was, I'm going for this prize. It's, we're celebrating my success. Different message, different message. How about if it's not impulse control? What if you're trying to monitor um, problem solving strategies? You know, so far this kid has gone, I can't do this, I stop. What could you have them monitor? So maybe if you're working on the, the skill of visualization as the new strategy, you can say, when you get stuck, if you draw a picture of it first, you're going to get a point for at least trying the picture strategy. And how many times when you got stuck did you do that? And did, how many times did it help? So they have to be able to see a relationship between what you're doing as a strategy and what their progress is, or it just doesn't count. Just can't, because remember when I had below the line, I am not collecting any more of that data. I'm just covering my tail and doing what I have to do. That's a teacher who's not getting the idea of, don't you want to check to see if what you're doing is working? And if you're not using the data, no, then they don't see any purpose. That's just busy work for them. So that would be a big deal. So this is what the, the kids' record keeping might look like that we call this the rule of four. And any time you get four consecutive data points below the goal line that you've established with this child, then you are doing the wrong intervention with them. What did you hear there? Is it the kid's problem? It's you, it's me. We are not doing the right thing or it would go up. So you could see that this child was doing just fine, all of a sudden hit a hard part. And you notice that across the horizontal axis are the weeks of the school year. And up the, the vertical axis are the possible scores this child can get. And so this is number of digits correct in the, the response, the answer, and this is a math one. And so if I see this pattern, here's how this conversation goes. Okay, Callie, that you see what, what I have here. This chart is showing this big dip. You know what that means? It means I'm doing the wrong thing with you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a line. You see this line? Yes. That's what I drew. And I have three interventions here three ideas of how to make your scores go up again. So you look at that and you choose which one. Why would I let Callie choose? I'm the teacher. If the kid thinks it's going to work, you're halfway home. And so, now what if this whole table was having the same problem? Do I get them all choices? Probably not because I can only handle so much as a classroom teacher. So I might say, all right ladies, how about you choose the strategy you think might work best? And it might not be the end up being the same one for all of you, but we'll start there if you wouldn't mind. And so I give them the paper and walk away. I come back and say, what did you decide? And they went, we think. CRA practice. What does CRA stand for? You learned that yesterday. Concrete to representational to abstract. We are going to do that. Now, if you want to read about CRA, don't, don't just Google CRA because a whole bunch of crazy stuff come up. <laughs> CRA math will get you someplace. Or go to a website called What Works Clearing House. And that government puts the most powerful pieces of research on that website. And at first I hated that website because I couldn't find anything I wanted because I was going to research. No, don't go there. And you go, really? Finally, I said to a lady, I hate your web website. And she said, well, what's the problem? So she told me, go to publications 
And under publications, which is a drop down, there are things called practice guides. And the practice guides, there are like 20 of them. And there's one of how to teach fractions for kindergartners, how to teach this, how to teach that, um, you know, absenteeism, all kinds of things. And it'll have like eight or ten of the top researched strategies. And it'll just list them for you in this practice guide, which has like 200 pages in it. Don't download it. Just find what you need in there and download those pages. And then it'll get, list them, and then the ones you're interested in, you can go behind and have the explanation of. So it will give you really good information. And, and so this is one of the places you can... It's What Works Clearinghouse. And I think it's a .gov, but if you put What Works Clearinghouse, it'll get you close enough that it, you'll be able to get a hit on that. And it's practice guides that you want to look for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So once we have Kelly on the new program, the CRA program, then, you know, she's still below the line here. Oh, well. And now she's hitting the line. Now she's below. Now when she goes these two below, I am not going to freak out because it could be a bad day for her. It could be a bad prompt for her. But if I get four of them in a row, then you're talking a statistically significant pattern, and that means you have to change it again. So I would draw a new line, and up here I would put, this is the new strategy I am now going to use with her. And every time I change strategies, I'd write it on her progress monitoring uh, chart, because then if eventually we're beginning to suspect a disability, if I show a psych, here are the results, then I did this, here are the results, then I did this, then here are the results, that psych is going to kiss the ground I walk on because that is exactly the kind of information that is really, really helpful. Whereas if you just hand me a bunch of data, but I don't know what you were doing to get that data, that's not so much. Now, on that... Uh, I'm, I'm going to change websites on you here. We're not at what works anymore. This is back to Intervention Central, which is a dot com org. Thank you. And at the very top of what he calls tools, he has something, or he keeps switching the order of things, so that always messes with me. But there's something called the Behavior Reporter. <laughs> and you, there are blank boxes like this that you can write any behavior you want to track in, or there are some predetermined <laughs> ones that you can just do a, a menu pick from. And then there are different ways that you can track it. You can track it by the day, you can track it by the week. That This one happens to be a weekly one. There's a monthly track. And you can set that up any way you want to. And if you're doing with little kids, you can just do smiley faces, straight faces, frowny faces kind of thing. There are lots of, that you can do a Likert scale of on a scale of one to 10 or one to nine, where do you find yourself? And with anything, I mean, what this table was talking about of do the kids have enough sophistication to be able to identify where they are on that scale is always the question that you're asking yourself. So what I would do is I would track and they would track and then we would have a small conference and say how did you score yourself and what evidence do you have and this is how I would score it and this is why and then we'd come closer and closer and closer over a period of time so that we both have the same ending picture in our mind so for instance let's just talk about the you know, the papers, that would be one way I could do it. The other one would be exactly what Molly was saying of, you know, I am now putting tally marks every time I catch myself uh, shouting out. And with me, I just put a piece of tape down my arm, masking tape, and, and it would say the child's name I was tracking, and every time she shouted out, I would just make a tally mark. I wouldn't necessarily have to say anything, although maybe we'd make eye contact, and I'd go... <laughs> and then I would date it and say, because you don't have to tally everything she does. It would be a, 
a time segment. So for 15 minutes, first 15 minutes of the class, I'm going to tally that and then I'm going to give it up because I have other things that I need to do. And so then I would just put that in a folder and date it and time it. And then I would have kind of a running record of what I think. And I would look at Molly's score sheet and say, now, did you come up with as many as I did? And then if it was way off, then we would need to go back to the paper thing where we were actually making contact every time. But after a while, you don't have to do that because their awareness goes up. And, but it's that talking to kids about how are we doing? Is what I'm doing helping you? Is it not that you're really going for? So at your table, talk about what is the most significant thing I just said that rang true with you. Ready, go. So here's what I hope you heard. The kids need to be charting their progress as well as you, or if it's only one or the other, the kids chart the progress. But teachers have to have conversations with the kids about the progress and what they did to move forward. And celebrate when they're making even small successes. Because it's really disheartening if somebody's always chewing on you about something and you're trying really hard and you know you're better, but they're still not happy with you. And many teachers know this exactly because it seems like no matter how hard we work, somebody's not happy with something we're doing. And that's okay because we can always get better, but do I do anything right? And sometimes you have to balance that talk. And so the modeling of self-talk, which we were talking about yesterday and today about being above the line is part of it of I just can't stop shouting out and you go okay now that's the below the line so what kind of help do you need so that you can get better at that you may not be able to stop altogether but we'll get a lot better and things will get smoother here and so that kind of of talk is is critical fixed mindset I gave you a slide that says here's what fixed mindset kids believe and if you were going to take each one of those statements which are all below the line statements are they not and help that kid move up you heard Carol say, well, we inserted growth mindset statements in your math assignments. What would you insert in that assignment? So I'm just going to give you a number. Pretend those are numbered because there's seven, yes? Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. Take that statement and just say, if a child said this to me, here's how I would flip them above the line. Okay, just go around the room and tell the statement, the, the fixed mindset statement, and how you would try to help that child go the next place. And we can chime in and try to help anybody who you say you could also say this or you could say this because there would be lots of different possibilities here. The point is you're not fixing it for them. If you tell them exactly what they should do and think, then it's your monkey, not theirs. You understand what I'm saying? So you have to help them think above the line, not you. So, okay, I'm good or not. And if you can choose something that they really struggled with, the example probably is going to stick a little bit better than things that, well, I used to not be able to do this and I can do this, but I just got it. And they don't know how they got it. So focus on strategy and effort. I think that was the key to what she was saying. So when I'm frustrated, I give up. And if don't ever just give them one strategy, right? because then you're fixing it. But if you say you could do this or this or this, which one would work for you, then they have to choose, then they have to own. So I don't like to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Or where would you like to start with this? 
any of those kind of things. Perfect. How about, tell me I'm smart. How much experience you've yeah. had is, mm -hmm. is smart. And I think that, uh, who was it? Uh, the movie of stupid is as stupid does or whatever. Forrest Gump. <laughs> you might just play some yeah. little clips about, you know, smart is as smart does too. You're not going to get any smarter if you don't build experiences. <laughs> I don't know where I would go with that. Okay. If you succeed, I feel threatened. Have you seen people who are like that? So how would you kept turn that one around? Is that the one that you guys have? Okay, go ahead, Kathy. Okay, yeah. And the more teachers and parents, by the way, because parents are the, the major impact here, the more parents say, are you better than you were yesterday? Not compared to everybody else. Are you getting better? As opposed to, you got a C and everybody else got an A. Do you understand that when you put kids in competition that you, you, build, you are really strengthening that? So the more you focus on grades as opposed to learning, the worse this gets. And do any of you know people who have IQs off the chart that didn't do anything? And some of the kids that I went to school with that I went, I wish I was as smart as they, who promptly failed flunked out of first year college because they didn't know how to study and I knew how to study because school was hard for me. And I also have a sister who could buy and sell me in brains who can't hold a job worth anything. So you know that's that's all part of it. It's more about the effort you're willing to put into it than you could be ever so smart and not use any of that. So yeah we'd have to come up with a, I would have a hard time coming up with a logo, you got a hard one. <laughs> What did you do with I'm good or not? So, and then I gave you the growth mindset things. There are several video clips on YouTube that you could look at, that you could use with kids. I mean, one a tortoise and a hare kind of uh, an animation. And, but I think over and over and over talking to them about when you think this, things good happen really, really well for you. When you think this, not so much. So we're going to talk about the intervention assistance team or the SST, whatever it is that you call it. And I am going to give you the Margaret version of this. And your job is to say how much like this is the one we use. Are there any pieces we can steal shamelessly? <laughs> Whoever said that to me just a minute ago. Or are there some things that you go, I don't think we can quite transport that into our, our setting. And so <clears throat> here is my thinking about what the purpose of an intervention assistance team or a problem solving team is. And the number one purpose is not directly for the kids. It's to build capacity in the adults. So when I took over as principal of whatever building I happened to be principal of at that point in time, my, it, it seemed like every faculty I worked with had the idea that you go to an IAT or an SST when you think this child is eventually going to end up with an IEP. And if you're not going that direction, you don't go there. Now see, in my opinion, this should be the ounce of prevention, not the pound of cure. And anyhow, uh, getting an IEP is not any kind of cure anyway, it's just a label. So even if the child had an IEP already, I think if the faculty doesn't know what to do with this child, this is the way you go. It's the backup system for any teacher who gets stuck. And for that matter, for any parent who gets stuck. Uh, when I was in my fourth year of being a principal at a Toledo school, the first three IATs that were called were called by parents' request not the faculty. And the first lady that came in said, I understand that this really helps parents. And I said, that's our intent. And she said, my kids will not go to bed at night. <laughs> Could I have an IET for that? I said, absolutely. And of course, when I said to the four teachers that I wanted to sit in on this conference, I said, okay, we're going to help this mom get her kids to bed at night. They went, really, Margaret? Like, we don't have enough to do. We're going to do that. And I said, no, no, no. Think about it. 
when the kids don't go to bed at night, who pays in the morning? And she's a young mom, and her kids are just kindergarten and fourth grade, and she has three more at home. Guess what? We're going to pay for this for a long time. And she just hadn't had a good, ex a good modeling experience of how do you get the little folks to bed from her own mother. And so she didn't have any idea about, okay, if everybody's ready by this time, I'm going to start reading the book, but you can't come in here until you're ready. And, you know, I, I'm the oldest of six, and I'll tell you, six kids could scurry really fast to get the best place on the bed while mom was reading the story. So <clears throat> the second part there is establishing, this is for the IUT, not to go to bed, the establishing that safe and welcoming environment. So this is the point where I tell you a sad story. <laughs> um, I told you that I adopted a child from Paraguay or South America, I think I said, but in Paraguay specifically. And when we adopted him, he was dying of failure to thrive. And I mean, real close to dying. He had given up all sounds, including crying. He was four and a half months old and couldn't raise his head. I mean, this kid was in terrible, terrible shape. And so as he had lots and lots of attention, you know, with a two and a half year old in, the, you know, every time he would move, she was over the crib. And he began to learn that, you know, when he moved, people actually came. And so things started to change fairly rapidly, actually, even before we left the country, he was starting to show enormous growth. So by the time he was in kindergarten, he was looking like a very typical child, busy little fellow, but really, really on target. And after about a month or so in kindergarten, we got the first call of, we need to see you for a conference. Well, this couldn't be good. So we went in and she said, well, when I say it's time for circle, he says, why, thank you for offering, but I am not coming today. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, he's always really nice about it, but he is not coming today. And so that was kind of the beginning of a long history of, I am not. <laughs> And the other thing we noticed is that as she tried to teach him letter sounds, he could not pick up on that. So discerning sounds of letters was not one of the things that was going to happen for him anytime soon. If you go to a school where they're hell-bent to teach you phonics as the only way to read, guess what? If you're a child like this, you're not going to read. And they put him in Title I, and then they put him in Special Ed, and they did all magical things for him. No, no reading. I hold a reading certificate, but do any of you have children who will not let you be the teacher? They, you're the mom, you're the mom, and I'm, that's it. And so it was a complete, you know, go to war thing. If, and so going, okay, I'm not doing that. So about the middle of second grade, when none of these things had worked, I said, okay, we have to get a tutor that knows a neurological impress method, and we are just going to drop this phonics thing. So it didn't take her too long, about a half a year, and all of a sudden he's reading. However, do you know what happens to children who don't read until third grade? They despise reading. They hate it. Every time you say, read this book, they run the other way. So here we have a child who now can read but won't. And that comes back to bite you about fourth grade, gets worse in fifth grade. Sixth grade, we get a call on our first intervention assistance team. Now, I wrote this program for the State Department in Ohio 35 years ago. So who would you think would not be intimidated by going to an IET? Ha! Huh. It's your kid. It's a different deal, I want to tell you. So I walk into the meeting and there are seven teachers seated around the table. Now that's safe and welcoming. <laughs> and I'm not intimidated much by this except because I am a teacher, but I couldn't help thinking if I had been a student who had had a very rough time going through school and nothing happy in the, as a primary memory of school, this would just creep me right out. So <clears throat> we sat down and one by one, these teachers took turns confessing my child's sins aloud. Yes, he does that in my room too, and he's not handing in this, and he's messing around and laughing and making everybody laugh when he should be listening. Blah, 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 blah. Now, I knew that nobody was telling a lie there. I had heard this before, and we had done multiple things. However, 
that's hurtful because somebody back here in the back of your head is saying maybe if you'd have been a better parent you know that is not helpful it is not it makes you downshift and so after they got finished with this run the gauntlet you know about my child then they said well thank you for coming and you go really that is your IAT I will not be coming back to another one of these now I didn't say that I just said in myself no more of this so it wasn't until his sophomore year in high school that we got the second call for an intervention assistance team. And the first thing I said is, tell me your protocol for what does that meeting look like? And she said, well, everybody will bring their grade book. And I said, stop there, not coming. And she's, what? And I said, I've been to one of those kind of meetings. I already know his grades. I'm on progress book every night. Those teachers are fabulous about sending me emails when we have an issue like a big project due and he doesn't look like he's moving that way. I said, if we're just going <clears> to <throat> admire the problems, I don't need to do that. I already know what the problems are. Are we going to talk about solutions? Quiet. So obviously they were going to do the same thing to me they did the first time and I'm going, I have none of that. I am not a fan. So. She said, well, what is it that we're supposed to do? Because she obviously knows I'm a trainer. And <clears throat> so I said, we can run this meeting together if you want to. And at this point, everybody in the room goes, thank you, God, she doesn't live in our district. <laughs> <laughs> and so we decided to do that. And so I prepared my child and my husband because they hadn't had the training to do that but she was supposed to train to get the teachers ready and I think I mentioned this morning that one of the rules of the meeting is everybody comes with three ideas so we have a very specific goal in mind of what we're going to address and it's not everything on the list it's like you know some of the big leverage things that we think will make a big difference for him and we say okay so bring one idea for the teachers what would work in a classroom one idea for what you think would work at home and one idea that you think would the child could do for himself and everybody does this including the child so I'm sitting down with my son and having this conversation which was not particularly pleasant but he came up with okay you and dad could do this and I would appreciate it if the teachers would do this and then I could do this okay those are your three ideas yeah Okay, and Michael and I came up with three, two, you know, teachers, us, child. So in the morning when it was time to, to go to this meeting, here he comes down the stairs and he said, I do not want to go to this meeting. <laughs> Newsflash, nobody wants to go to this meeting, <laughs> but we have to make this problem go away. And so he said, well, I am not talking at this meeting and you can't make me. Well, that would be true. And so I said, I can't make you talk, but I will tell you this right in advance, that the, if you don't do your part in this meeting, your phone becomes my phone right after the meeting. And he said, go ahead and take it. And this kid would shoot himself in the foot every time just to make his point. So I figured that's exactly what was going to happen. So he's grumbling all the way to the high school. And we walked in, and he wouldn't, he had his hoodie up over his head. And I don't know about in your school, but in our school, that is a violation of the dress code. And fortunately, nobody chose to die on that hill that day. So they, he slumped down in the chair, and all you could see is gray fabric. And, you know, he's like, <laughs> dot like this. And so everybody knew where we were standing with my child. And so I knew that the social studies teacher just walked on wherever. I mean, this woman was fabulous. And so I thought, we'll start with her. So I said, Terry, what kind of ideas do you have for you know, solving this problem? And she went, boom, boom, boom. And then looked at the English teacher and said, you know, and what kind of ideas do you have? And he was making stuff up, I could tell, but that's okay with me. And he put <laughs> a couple of things up. And we started going around the table, and we got to the Spanish teacher, and she said, well, I am sick and tired of pampering children like this. I go, whoa. First of all, one of the norms of the meeting is you may not 
talk about any problems. Nothing, nada, not one word about problems. Only about the goal and how you're going to get us there. And so this is the way you kind of sidetrack that conversation when somebody goes off the rails. You know, say, you know, if you have something that you need to talk about, we can do that right after the meeting. But during this 20-minute meeting, it's all about how are we going to reach that goal. That's it. And she says at that point, well, then I pass. Here's my advice to you. Try real hard not to look like an ass at the meetings. <laughs> and you go, what are you thinking? And so we went around the table and my son was sitting on this side of me and most of the people were this side. So I had kind of angled my body so I didn't notice that he had pushed his hoodie off and he was sitting straight in his chair and paying attention to what people were putting up there. And when it came to be his turn, the counselor said, so Kent, what do you think? Um, what are your ideas? And boom, 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 the three ideas went up. <laughs> and we're all going, whoa, this is good. And so the only person who's allowed to choose from the category, like under the student ideas, that everybody's put one up there, only the child is allowed to select. And so she said, so what are you choosing out of your category? And he chose two things. And she said, you're really willing to do this? He says, well, if I don't, she's going to take my phone away from me. <laughs> there you go. That works for me. I don't care. <laughs> so then the teachers chose, you know, what they wanted to do. And Michael and I chose what we wanted to do. And as we walked out of the office and we were going to the parking lot, but he was going to class, he looked at his dad and he said, you know, I didn't even know Mr. DeLotter liked me. Now that English teacher had never crossed swords with my son, not once. So I would have had no clue that there was anything but a good relationship there. But you never can tell what the kids think the relationship is. So my question to you for your table talk is, what is it that you think happened during that meeting? Or what was it about the meeting that would have taken a child who was just hell-bent not to play nice and not only turned it around to, I'll do my part, but kind of like, whoa, this is amazing. And that's pretty much what happened. So your turn to talk now. So what did you say about that? What do you think changed the attitude of my child? Yes. Can you imagine being a child and having nothing but we could help you this way, 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 when that had not been your experience of when mom and dad have to come to school. So that changes things dramatically. And I think you're right. The fact that the one teacher who was going to step out of line was not allowed to do so and nobody was going to let it. Now, occasionally, it's the parents who step out, and they say, he won't ever do what I say, and, and you have to pull that in just as fast as you would do it to a faculty member. And so you have to have that understanding before they enter the room, or it doesn't feel real safe to them. So usually when I'm on the phone and I'm calling and making the appointment, I say, now here are a couple of the rules. One is we no one no, you're not your child, not me, not you, not anybody else at that meeting is allowed to talk about a problem until after the child is out of the room and then we can talk about anything you want to. But during that time, it has to be a 100% positive environment. So if I would happen to forget, and I always use myself as the first example, please feel free to say, I think we need to talk about those kinds of things later. If you forget, I'm going to take that same liberty. Is that okay? And if they say no, then we don't have them at the meeting. We have a separate meeting with them. And if they, I have never had a parent say no. I've had a parent who didn't abide by it a time or two. And one that even after I said, you know, during this meeting, it's all about Heather and how we're going to help her. So when we're finished, we can talk about this. You're not telling me what I can talk about what I can't. And he would not let it go. So I had to say, OK, everybody can uh, adjourn and we'll have this meeting at another time because dad and I need to talk. 
but you're not going to start you know beating up the teachers in public that's not going to happen so <clears throat> or your child so I think that's key that environment and you might think well not being able to talk about the problem is a small rule it's a huge rule huge how like your meetings is that do you admire the problems mostly so because if you're talking about data and stuff like that guess what you're talking about the problem if you're saying we want to move them from the starting point to here and here's how we're going to do it now you're being above the line and that's what this is about and and that's the, the key point if you don't do the legwork up front you don't have a goal to call the parent with because you don't know what the problem is so all the things we've been talking about for these two days about drilling down to what the real problem is is then the beginning of a goal if we change this about the way we teach we're going to get this new response from the child in this amount of time not longer than six weeks as measured by and that's the way you write that goal so <clears throat> yeah that's a key point so you're really modeling good problem solving and the other thing we've talked about accommodations and interventions several times during the two days but I want to make sure you have your arms around those definitions. Now, a modification requires an IEP because you're actually changing the requirements for a child. Every child is entitled to accommodations and interventions. So what's the difference? Here's the way I'm going to, I'm going to use an analogy to see if I can help you with that. Think of accommodations as crutches. They are things you use to get you over the rough spot. So I think I told you that like 10 or 11 weeks ago, I had a total hip replacement. And that first, I'm with a walker and a therapist. And then I was allowed to walk without the therapist. And then I used a cane for a long time. And for the last couple of weeks, ha -ha, nothing. Now, what if I would have decided to use that walker and I was still using it? Good idea? No, it becomes a part of the disability then because it keeps you from strengthening your body so that you can do without. The idea is to get rid of the accommodations as much as is feasible for you. Now, if I need the accommodation of glasses, guess what? That one's not going away anytime soon. In fact, that just keeps getting worse and worse. So it's not like there aren't some accommodations that need to stay. But most of the accommodations that children have who are learning disabled, like you can have reduced assignments, you can have more time, I'll read it to you, need to be coupled with interventions and faded out as much as you can. And the more you fade, the stronger the child becomes. So what does that take? It takes an intervention where the real hard, heavy lifting mentally happens with the kid, not the teacher. So you have a white envelope on your table and it has accommodations and interventions on it. And what I want you to do is sort them out and see if you get them in the right spot. Okay, so this is one way to think about accommodations and interventions that gets you out of the learned helplessness piece. So if you assign a reading buddy in science class, where does that go? It's an accommodation. The child is not learning to read. You're just saying, I need to have you learn this science stuff and I'm going to make it easy for you by reading it to you because I'm not the one that's going to teach you how to read here. Now, if you're doing an intervention is actually teaching them strategies so they can read it by themselves. But when you're doing the work for them just so they can access the material, that's more of an accommodation. When you say give them more time to finish assignments, definitely an accommodation because you're making a judgment that it's overwhelming if you give them too much so you're just backing off a little bit to make it possible for them to do at least part of the assignment 
Now, watch this one. He's going to mark how far he can get in three minutes. Do you understand it takes this one where I'm going to say, this is how far you get in this amount of time, and it switches it, so now Sarah's making her own choice. You are teaching her to break big problems down to smaller components and say, I think I can get here by this amount of time, and then they time themselves and see if they can do it. And they're beginning to take control of their own executive functioning skill of breaking big problems down to little ones. Now you're building strength like, an in, like therapy would build strength in a child's body so they can walk on their own. You are giving them strategy so they can walk on their own uh, academically. Um, have them use tape lectures to revise their notes. This one always trips up everybody. Good. It, you would think of it as an accommodation if the period were after give them all your notes on tape. But the fact that they're using that tape, a tool that you gave them, to now be able to get their notes better because you've given them an extra bit of help to train them how to think through that. Now we're talking more intervention. You're building strength in note taking. Teach them to ask for assistance. It's an intervention because when kids just sit there and do nothing when they don't know what to do, that is not helpful. So an intervention is, okay, I'm going to teach you different ways to ask people for help so that when you get stuck, you have this, this set of strategies that you're doing. Um, cue them to begin and end. Because the teacher is doing the decision making here. Uh, read the tests. Teach them to self-correct. Big one, because that's the self-monitoring piece. Um, if you and the, and the parents are checking the assignment notebook, and not a particularly strong one at that, um, kids explaining step-by-step -step directions. An intervention, because that's a self-monitoring piece, I'm checking with somebody, do I understand this? And if it's a self-monitoring piece, then it's more powerful than an accommodation. Front load the vocabulary before the class. A fabulous accommodation. When you have on a child's IEP extra time, my recommendation is the extra time needs to be before the teacher teaches the lesson, not after. Start the kids early so they can hand in the paper with everybody on time. Pre-teach the vocabulary so that when you're doing your lecture, they don't sit there and go, I don't know what you're talking about. Because if you build enough prior knowledge, then they can be more part of the class. So that extra time needs to be forward as much as you can do it. Um, using manipulatives to explain his thinking. That's an intervention. He's doing the explaining his thinking. You're not doing that. You're just giving him tools and teaching him how it's easier to do. Does that help? Oh, go. Oh, wait time. I must have taken that off as a as a check. Wait time is an accommodation that every child deserves because if you don't have wait time, you don't have time to really think. But you're not really teaching them a skill with wait time. You're just being courteous. <laughs> Okay, helpful or makes you nuts? A little both. <laughs> okay, would you package those back up? I despise t cutting those things out. In the book, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do, there are charts in that book that show how we have taken an accommodation and moved it to less of an accommodation, more of an intervention, and on, you know how we fade out accommodations. So there's some charts like that. Now, if you look up on the screen, <clears throat> here's the process, the entire process of the problem solving process of IAT the way I was starting to describe it to you. The teacher always needs to talk to the parents before you start any kind of a formal process. I think it is rude 
not to go to the parents and say, this is a problem your child is having before you start getting involved in something that's more official. As a parent, would you not be offended? I mean, that's your kid. And sometimes teachers will say, well, they should be seeing these papers coming home, or I sent, sent emails. Well, kids have a way of disposing of those sometimes. Or some parents just don't, don't pay attention. And so then you go through with a coach, generally, kind of the things that we've been doing for two days of drilling down and saying, if this is the pro symptom, what could possibly be the problem? And if that's the problem, drill down to, well, why is that still happening? Why is that still happening? And we go five iterations deep at the minimum. And then that allows us to set a goal. So this is what Pam was saying when she was saying, do you not meet beforehand to get your ducks in a row so you know exactly what you're talking about before you actually schedule the meeting. And once you've had this meeting with the coach, then usually I would recommend that the teacher call the parent. And here's why. You always want to have the teacher be the center of power. The minute somebody else starts calling and recommending, it makes the teacher look a little weak. And so if the teacher is kind of at least doing the major part of the communication, even though the teacher has asked for assistance, that teacher is still controlling the process. So I will call my own parents and say, here's where the meeting's going to be, and here's what the rules are at the meeting that everybody uh, agrees to, and here's your assignment. Would you like help with that assignment? Do you need help coming up with ideas? And this is the way it's going to go. And then you do the same thing with the child. Now, the only time I would say that would not be true would be this. If the parent and you have already crossed swords and things are not very happy there, then it's not safe and welcome to have you call because that automatically is going to make them mad. So then somebody else needs to do it. One time as a teacher, I had to say to the principal, I cannot play the advocate with this child and get him ready because I so want to just slap that kid silly. He's driving me nuts. And the principal said, well, it can't be me either, because if there are anybody in this school, I'd like to just boot right out and be Jimmy. And so we had to have actually a superintendent come down and play the advocate for him during these meetings. And so <clears throat> whoever the child feels safe with and the parents feel safe with would be a good choice. And then expert people. In my schools, what we did is we took the executive functioning skills, although we didn't know they were executive functioning skills then, and key math and reading and writing skills, and assigned one topic to each group. So you would be the focus group. You would be the organization group. You would be the memory group. You would be the planning, uh, planning group. You would be impulse control, self-monitoring, reading, writing, math. Got it? Now watch what happens if, um, let's say, Anne proposes that a child go to an IET with a reading problem and a focus problem. Then we're going to get one person from the reading table and one person from the focusing table who have been compiling interventions that are not commonly used in our school already. Because the last thing Anne wants is for you to tell her to do the th same thing she's been trying and hasn't worked so far. So this is kind of going to add a fresh face to it. And that's going to be the IAT. So if later somebody else says, OK, I have this child who can't write very well and has a memory like a sieve, then we're going to go to the writing table and get an expert, and we're going to go to the memory, was that you guys, <laughs> table, and get somebody, and that's going to be the IAT. So do you understand that it's not the same five people every time we meet? It is specifically tailor-made to the child's case, and only people who have been studying that and putting together a database of really cool things to do with this kid are going to be invited to the meeting, which is going to make it go from here 
to here almost instantly. The other thing it does is you don't have to sit around and wait for this team's schedule to clear because you're using lots of different people and so you can get service to the teacher fast. We always promise within seven days if you want a meeting that fast, you will have it. And 100% of the time you will walk out that door with an action plan. 100% of the time. And only that time I had to let Mr. Gruder, oh, <laughs> oh well, he's probably gone. Uh, only that one time that the dad would not let the, the arguing go and I had to cancel the whole meeting, did that not happen. So talk at your table for a minute about if you had these expert pools around and if you let that flexible scheduling thing happen, how would that change the whole problem solving process in your building? Ready? Go. So one of the questions that we were just talking about over here was at what age do you bring these children in? You were two? <laughs> and um, I will not lie, Kin preschoolers are just a royal pain because they can't sit still for 20 minutes. And so we would bring them in at the very beginning and say, okay, we're going to help you with this. And they would put their three ideas up on the chart. And then um, when they wanted to leave, when they were starting to get antsy, we had a fourth or fifth grader out in the office that for those 10 minutes would play with that child and then we'd bring them back in and say okay now your mom and dad picked this and the teacher picked this is what we're going to do now which one of these things do you want to pick it doesn't make any difference what they pick you just want them to be an owner of the process and so kindergartners do a lot better a whole lot better than that they just have to be prepped and if the little ones decide not to talk at the meeting, you don't take their phone away from them. You just go, okay, would you like me to tell them what we were talking about? Because you've already been in a meeting with them and you know what they were going to say. So I'd say, I can put the cards up for you, but you have to tell me if I got it right or not. So I would say, well, this is what she picked. Did I get that right? <laughs> it might not say anything because it's intimidating with all those big people in there. So... <clears throat> Um, the other thing was, how do you set up this expert pool? Because this is not an easy thing to do, but it pays big, 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 big. So the first thing is we would brainstorm the things, the categories that the faculty said, these are the things that we need help with consistently. I don't care who we have, year after year after year, we're going to have these problems. And you would have some academic and you'd probably have... Um, you know, basically the executive functioning. I have never seen a child with an academic or behavior problem that hasn't drilled down to executive functioning problems every single time. So that would be a smart thing to set up, even if that's all you could set up. So <clears throat> the uh, next thing is, let's just say that this table had selected their area, their responsibility if they were in my school, now you can change the rules any way you want to, is that they needed to come up with one intervention in that area. Let's just say you're in the memory group or what, I can't remember what you really were. And you needed to find one intervention that you all tried in your classroom for a month. And you actually had experienced it, had played with it, had tweaked it around a little bit. You had information on a couple of kids about how well it worked. And you might have some ideas about these are the kind of kids it works with real well and not so much with these. And you can really speak as an expert because you've been there. You've lived it. It's not about just putting a database together because there are databases all over the place. What Works Clearinghouse, Intervention Central, all of the ASCD books. You've had those forever. How's that working for you? See, teachers don't want a book and they don't want a website. They want to walk down the hall and they want to talk to somebody and say, what do you think I ought to do with this kid? That's what they want to do. And that's what this provides. So, <clears throat> oh, and that you need in your classroom right now. Don't pick something you can't use. 
because then you're doing the work for somebody else as opposed to your own personal press professional development one of the men in one of the middle schools said I said what's your area and he said well school phobia and I said how many phobic children do you have in your room he said none I said why did you pick that I mean how are you going to practice on anybody so you need to pick something that you really need and then uh, really do the strategy and monitor it and here's here's the easiest way to do it if you give the people who are the writing experts this chart then you can say here are all the areas where you eventually over a period of years might need to have an intervention so pick whatever you want so it's not like just throwing daggers at some you know a dart set of dartboard kind of thing and then the second thing is you need to provide resources so they don't have to look all over creation I have hundreds of hours in that book hundreds just finding research-based interventions why should you have to spend hundreds of hours you don't have that time so if you just take this book this will keep you busy for about two years poof Marzano's book that'll keep you busy for a year and a half or no probably more because there are a lot of strategies in there even though there are only nine chapters and so you don't need tons of information if the teachers just say let's try this one this month boom you're good unless everybody's already doing that then don't pick that one <clears throat> and then you come up with a list of classroom interventions the first year that's all we did but I wish we had been just a little bit smarter from the word go because after a while we said if this is the classroom intervention here's the parent version of that and here's a kid version of that so if it was uh, organizing things sorting and organizing here are some things that teachers can do well parents can have the kids sort and organize the silverware at night they can have them sort things in their bedroom they can have them sort cards or papers or something I mean something that's not homework something that they can actually use in their own home and then the same thing for the kids some game they could play some you know reminder how did you use that learn that skill you weren't born doing it so just little tips you can give kids and then we just pull out these lists when the kids have to pick their three categories and there they, there you have them it makes it easy when it's phonics for any of you who are early childhood we give phonic strategies to the teachers the parent version of that is when your child comes to a word they don't know tell them because we do not want parents messing around with the phonics because they go ba is b you know no it isn't it's ba and so if they're going to mess with it don't give them that to do and then you know what to do with the children and then this is what i was talking about when I think you were asking about um, how do you share out and I said in some schools we take one concept per month and we provide you know here are two or three things you could do everybody in the whole school try something that works for you and then we do the observations of one another and that's the way you get everybody good at lots of interventions so do you understand how this could help talk quickly at your table about what would that take at your school and what kind of a welcome reception would you get okay the one thing that can just absolutely make this go crash burn is when you don't carve time through the school day for the teachers to do this work it's not like they can add one more thing to their plate they absolutely cannot so it needs to be in one school they signed up by grade levels because they already had grade level meetings and they said one day a month we're going to devote to coming up with an intervention that we all agree to do and then the next month we'd say how did that work out what were the pros and cons what were the little tips we can give and what's our next intervention and boom they were off and running again in some schools they let teachers pick by what they're more interested in but you have to have some common time with other people who have picked the same category as you because you need to have some coordination there
or at least some conversation. So if you have some time before school where everybody is open, you might say once a month we're going to use that 20 minutes or 30 minutes to, to do this or after school to do this. Or we can Skype anytime we want to. I mean, there are lots of possibilities, but finding the time is really tough. One of the principals that I worked with in Avon Lake said, okay, I am going to devote 50% of our faculty meeting time to you doing this, which would be much more productive than what he was doing. And he found out that was really, really helpful, total environment of the. And if you don't get the expert pool set up, your system will always shake a little bit in terms of the quality of the action plan that you got but at least you can do the other pieces. You know, don't wait until you can do the whole thing to do pieces, parts. So let me tell, show you what the meeting looks like. You have these people invited and everybody has three ideas. So you say, okay, the purpose of this meeting is to help, you know, this child do this. And then everybody puts their interventions down. Now I put four minutes, four minutes, and four minutes, but guess what, it doesn't work like that. It's just kind of a messy, put them all up there. I just put four, 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 so you wouldn't put all of the interventions in the teacher column and have nothing for the other two columns. It needs to balance out a little bit. And then you can only pick out of your own column, remember? So what if a parent says, I want you to sit by my kid and do every assignment with him. That's my, inner, my idea. How would you respond? Okay, would you just, in closing, just have a quick table talk about what was the most, uh, the best takeaway you've had for today? So how would you judge me? You have interventions? Do you have team ideas? Do you now have a problem-solving process that you can kind of pick and choose what works for you and modify what doesn't? So hopefully you feel like I've kept my promises to you. I feel like you kept your promises to the group as well. And here's what I'm hoping, that as a result of you being here, you look in that mirror and feel more powerful than you've ever felt before. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>